Uh, Nuggets Sixers last night. This this was a fun one to watch. It was the the battle of the big dudes, Jokic versus Embiid. I would say it delivered, and I would say Embiid came out on top on this one. Not only did they win, but his numbers were incredible. The 126-121 victory. Embiid, Maxi, and Tobias Harris combined for 90 of their points, and Embiid himself had 41, 7, and 10. Guys, um, it's one of the best games to watch so far. I was worried that somebody was going to sit beforehand, but we got it. Who wins the series if this were to actually be our finals, Lou? You know, this is going to be a funny answer, but strictly based on last night, I would say the Sixers, man. Joel Embiid was absolutely dominant. Tobias Harris was great for them, throwing in another 25 points. Maxi throwing in 26. You know, these guys were these guys were rolling. They look they look they look good. It looked like they were up for the challenge. But if you're asking me about a seven game series, I'm going with the defending champions. I like the way that they share the basketball. They can plug guys into that system. They play well together. That ball is moving. You know, this the the thing that we're gonna talk about is Jokic only having three assists, right? So if your center who's your best passer as well, only has three assists, that's going to affect the, the the ball game tremendously. And I thought that's what we saw last night. He wasn't allowed to be in the passing lanes and get the ball out to those guys like they wanted. But give a lot of credit to the Sixers, man. They played a, a hell of a game, and Joel Embiid was the head of that snake. But if you're asking me for seven games, hmm. give me Denver again. I, I want to ask because, you know, when, when we've seen these guys match up, Embiid has gotten some flack for, quote-unquote, ducking a couple of the matchups. But then you watch a game like last night, and you're like, why would this dude ever duck anything, Lou? I mean, I mean, he was incredible to watch yeah. last night. Are, are we making too much of that? That's a, that's a, that's a silly narrative. You know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go way back and do a deep dive into, you know, his injury history. You know, this guy has been a part of low management just as much as any other guys that we talk about when it comes to when it comes to low management you know he's had some situations where he's needed to take games off and it, listen if he's going to take games off and come in and give me two back to back 40s then take another night off big fella so that's a silly <laughs> narrative that he's ducking anybody ducking any smoke if you to know Joel Embiid is to know that he's an extremely competitive person and he wants all the smoke trust me he ain't ducking nothing Michelle 18th straight 30-point game or more for Joel Embiid. Sixth longest streak in NBA history. He has been absolutely dominant, and every single game that goes by, it's like, it's so easy. I think Kevin Durant tweeted the other day, like, it took him three quarters to score 40 points the other night. It, it's just, what, what he's doing right now is, is, is super impressive, and he's only building upon what he did last year. He won MVP last year, and you have to give the Sixers a lot of credit. They're well-balanced. Tyrese Max last night, 25 points. Tobias Harris, 24 points. And uh, this team has a, a wide range of score, scoring ability. You have Marcus Morris playing at a good level. Kelly Oubre uh, chipped in with 11 points. And we know Embiid's the dominant force, but around him, he's got guys playing at a high level too. Tyrese Max, he should be an all-star this year. Um, and when I talk to people around that Sixers organization last night, getting a sense of, like, what is Joel Embiid's mindset, uh, you know, during that game? Is he talking trash about Jokic? Is he, like, what, what is his frame of mind? They say, honestly, he's quiet, he's focused, and his biggest things are pointers he has to make. Like, if he wants a guy cutting to the basket, if he wants um, more pick and rolls, if he wants the team to make adjustments, he's going to speak out that. But other than that, he's focused on the game. And... Uh, I think Joel Embiid is just maturing year after year after year. Tyrese Maxey told me when he came in as a rookie, Joel Embiid wouldn't even speak. And now Joel Embiid, his wow. leadership and what he brings to the table as a professional, uh, as a leader, I think it, it means a lot to that organization. The idea that, I, that he wasn't even speaking is funny. There was a moment last night after the game, right after the game, with uh, Jokic and Embiid talking to each other, covering their mouths the whole nine. And then he was asked about it afterwards. He said, MB did, that he was telling Jokic, you know, you're the best player in the league, defending champs, yada, yada. Um, and then, of course, they cut to Shaq, and he's like, I don't know about that. So, Lou, I ask you, who is the most dominant big man in the league? 
you gotta you gotta you gotta put that down the middle 50 50 their impacts are completely different you know Joel Embiid is a score first guy I feel like Jokic is a pass first guy that can also score you know and so they give you two completely different dynamics if I got the first pick at the park and both of those guys are there I can close my eyes and pick one you know it's really that it's really that close to me <laughs> how they impact the game the way that they impact their teams is completely different, but it's dominant. Both are dominant at the same time. So I can't I can't call it. Joel Embiid is in a league of his own right now with the streak that he's on, but we've also seen the same type of production from Jokic as well. And so I, I, I honestly can't call it. I like both of these guys. Normally I would give you a hard time, but I actually think this is the right answer on this one. It's too, it's too tough. They're tied. Um, I will, you know, I, maybe this is negative. I don't know, but... He does lead the league, Joel Embiid does, as far as free throw attempts. I think he's averaging like 12. He had 15 last night. And opposing coaches aren't always pleased with that, Lou. Are they right? No, tell guys stop fouling. <laughs> you know, tell guys stop hacking. Because, you know, in my, in my career, I was a high free throw guy. I, I would pump, pump fake, get guys in the air. Or if your hand, your hand is out, I'm swinging through and I'm creating that contact because by the time I come into the game, nine times out of ten, our team is already in the bonus. And Joel Embiid, he's learned, he's learned that part of the game. Get you two easy free throws, take the pressure off your offense, go back down the court and set up, you know. And he's, like we said, we talk about his dominance. This guy, can he can face up at the three-point line. You have to respect him shooting a three. So he can get you with a head fake at the top of the key put the ball on the floor. A lot of fives not used to a five putting the ball on the floor. That's, that's when you get in foul trouble when you start using your hands. When you post up, he's a seven foot, 200 some pound guy that can really run through your chest and go lay the ball up. You have to guard that. So that gives you, a, that gives you another opportunity. He can play with his back to the basket. That's another opportunity to create fouls. And so give the man credit. He's doing a great job of putting a lot of pressure on defenses every single possession. So. Do coaches, are, is it annoying for a coach? Absolutely. But again, you got to have a, a better game plan for a guy that's going to give you four or five different looks to score the basketball. All right. I just have Sean. to add. I, just, I, yeah. I, I, just, I have to add, Michelle. Uh, you know, speaking about Lou, I follow Lou's career pretty heavily. There was only two players that got the calls that, that he got, him and James Harden. Lou, how did you do it? I, I just, <laughs> I, I've never asked you this question. You were drawing these yes. crazy fouls. So it was James. You and James were the only guys on the perimeter drawing these fouls. How, like, I, don't, I didn't even understand it. Yeah, because I, I, I think James and I, we were going into a lot of situations during games where we were just strictly looking for free throws. Like I said, if I'm coming off the bench and the first time I'm getting in a game and it's with three or four minutes left in that first quarter, the best thing that I can do to get myself going is to get a couple free throws before we start. So as soon as I grab the ball, I'm looking at what you're doing, whether your hand is out, whether you're a little jumpy or whatever. So I'm giving you a pump fake. If you go ahead and jump, I'm going to lean in. If your hand is out, I'm swinging through, and I'm going to get two, two easy free throws. But it was the gift and the curse. You know, James and I, we did it so well that they changed the rules because of us. You know, so that's how we were able to do it. It's just playing chess in the middle of the games, giving yourself an opportunity to get two easy points before the game gets going. Well, Lou, let me follow that I up with, did you like you guys that much? I was going to say that the rest loved you. And did you like <laughs> pissing everyone else off? Because that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, I remember one game in particular. I think it was on the Spurs scouting report. Um, and this was one of the games that I started. On the very first possession, I get a guy in the air, pump fake, three, uh, three free throws. <gasps> Pop pulls him immediately and he rails him. And I told you to stay down on <laughs> pump fakes. So these, you know, so trust me, these things are points of emphasis when it comes to game planning for teams. And so should teams be mad at Joel and B for drawing fouls? No, they should be mad at their guys for going for it. But it's so tempting to, you're moving. I have to, oh God, whatever. All right. Um, it is. It it's, is. It's just, it's like, ugh. Front court depth, sham, shams, shams. I almost called you shams. What am I, a stranger? Um, we're three weeks away from the trade deadline. Are, are we thinking, and there are so many teams that we're going to be looking at, and I'm so excited for this deadline this year, but is Philly going to be active? Are you expecting anything? I, I think they're going to be measured. I mean, th the one thing that they have going for them is they have these salaries like Marcus Morris and Robert Covington that are really in that range of, of it's not a major salary. You're not going to be bringing back a max contract type of guy but you're going to be bringing in a, a you know you could be in the market to bring back a, a really good bench piece a really good score hmm. um 
I, I think they're going to be active. I, I, I don't get the sense that they're as engaged right now on DeJounte Murray or Zach Levine or Pascal Siakam. I think those three guys, I, I have not gotten the sense that they are going to pursue those three uh, aggressively. I think there is a level of interest there for them, but not, not an aggressive pursuit. And so this is a team also, Michelle. They have max salary space in the summer. So if, if you want to go and commit yourself to a Zach Levine or DeJounte Murray, you remove yourself from the free agency conversation in the offseason. And they already have such a great thing going. Like, could you roll the dice and see what this team could do? Maybe add one more piece on the edges and see what this team could do as currently constructed with this core of Tobias Harris, Maxi, and Joel Embiid and see just how far this group can go before you make a decision in the summer. There's going to be options for them in the summer. They have a bunch of assets. Remember, they got two first-round picks from the Clippers. This team is going to have great, uh, I think, uh, ability to go add town if they want in the summer. It's this is going to be a fun one, Lou. Let me ask you: if you if one team had to strengthen their roster more, would you think it was Denver or Philly? And you got to pick one. And I'm not because <laughs> because <laughs> Come on. I feel. <laughs> Look, I, I feel like both of these teams, I, obviously any team that's trying to win a championship, they would love to strengthen their bench, give them an opportunity at the top of those second quarters uh, when your starters are out, you know, to either increase that lead or, or get a great plus minus situation going. But I, I like Reggie Jackson um, coming off the bench for Denver. You know, I like Christian Braun to get an opportunity to be a bigger part of what they're doing in Denver as well. He's getting a, he's getting some quality minutes and getting a quality experience and learning what it's like to be on a championship caliber team. And on the flip side of that, you got a you got a Pat Bev and you got a Marcus Morris coming off the bench for the Philadelphia 76ers. I like that mix of guys that can hold it down for seven to eight minute stretches while you know the the, the starting groups are, are taking a break. And so, would both of these teams like to get better on the bench? I'm sure, but. At, at what cost and at what position? You know, the Sixers, you can throw that ball to Marcus Morris five or six times, and he's going to give you a bucket. Who's going to be a better um, perimeter defender than, than Pat Bev? You know, Reggie Jackson has proven that he can go out and give you 25 to 30 points a game. Christian Braun plays with a lot of energy. So it's a lot of guys out there in the market that can strengthen both of these teams, but I don't see anything glaring for either one of them. It's a nice position to be in. Um, what about on the Philly side, the Maxi Harris and B 90 points combined? last night do you envision this as a, a championship core it is but I, listen that's gonna that's gonna be tough to do consistently you know we're talking about one guy that had 40 and two other guys yeah. 25 plus a piece that's it's, that's just gonna be tough to keep up with especially in the play in playoffs somebody's gonna get taken away somebody is gonna get absolutely wiped out of this series and the fans are going to go crazy. He's not playing well because they don't understand the tactics that comes with the playoffs. You know, in order for a team to beat you in a seven-game series, something has to be sacrificed, and you got to be, be willing to give up something. And so to expect these guys to play at such a high clip is unrealistic, but if they can pull it off, they're going to give themselves a real opportunity to be a championship contending team.